Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Kimberly Doris. I'm the executive director of the Graves Disease and Thyroid Foundation, and I'm joined today by Dr. Nancy Horde Patterson, who is the founder and chair emeritus of the GDATF. Uh, welcome, Nancy. Thank you, Kimberly. I'm very glad to be here. Thanks for joining us today. Um, we'll be uh, talking today about how patients experience thyroid eye disease. This was a paper that was published in Frontiers and in Endocrinology in November of 2023. And this paper came out of a, a larger survey project uh, that was commissioned by the Graves Disease and Thyroid Foundation. This project was funded by an educational grant from Amgen, formerly Horizon Therapeutics. The sponsor was not involved in the study design, collection, analysis, interpretation of data, or writing of the publication article. This is an open access article, and you can find it at that very bulky link um, at the in the first bullet point. Uh, easier ways to get to it are you can visit frontiersin.org and search for how patients experience thyroid eye disease, um, or you can visit our website at gdatf.org and select resources and then TED Survey uh, 2023. Uh, and Nancy, I know that when you um, first went to look up this article, um, you had some challenges with um, it, it just being able to to read the article um, at, at all. And so it's just kind of it's it's a little bit ironic because we did this to highlight challenges for people with low vision, um, and yet um, it wasn't in a format that that you were able to to read. No, I wasn't. Um, and it, it was frustrating, as many things are. So not only could I not read it, I couldn't take the I couldn't take the survey. But and, and that's a that's an issue that that we all need to work on is is how to make things readable. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so a, a couple of things that you can do in the meantime, if you are in Nancy's situation and not able to uh, clearly read the article, um, one option is to hold down the control key and click plus to enlarge the screen. Uh, you can also download as a PDF um, and uh, enlarge using the, um, the Adobe Acrobat um, PDF or use a screen reader uh, to listen to it. Um, or you can also export to MS Word. Um, the issue that Nancy and I had with that was that the tables uh, tended to get a little bit wonky. Um, but if uh, if none of that works, um, we've got you covered. Uh, we're going to hit all of the highlights of the paper in today's presentation. So the initial online thyroid eye disease survey consisted of 62 questions, mostly multiple choice. Um, three of the questions were allowed for free-form narrative. The survey went live in June of 2022 and closed at the end of July 2022. A total of 770 individuals opened the link to the survey. Uh, all of those 770 responses went through a screening process, and we were basically looking for four things. The participants had to consent to the use of their de-identified and aggregated responses, um, any information that could have tied a response back to a particular individual was stripped out. If they listed a doctor's name, if they listed a city, all of that came out before we saw the data. Um, participants had to be at least 18 years old. They must have received their TED diagnosis from a, me from a medical doctor and they had to have completed at least the first 11 questions of the survey, which we called the core questions. And 443 responses met the screening criteria. This survey collected way more data than would fit into one single paper in one single publication. We received literally hundreds of narrative responses as part of the survey. Uh, Nancy and I have read every single one of those, and we have collated them by category and made them available on our website at gdatf.org. Uh, Nancy and I are also working on a second webinar to share the results of the additional survey questions uh, that weren't covered in this paper, and most of those centered on treatment options. 
So who took this survey? Uh, in terms of age profile, the largest group by far was age 60 to 69 at 28%. Uh, just behind that, age 50 to 59 at 24 percent, and then at 18 percent, age 40 to 49, 17 percent, age 70 to 79. So that was really the bulk of who responded. Um, 3 percent were 18 to 29 years of age, 6 percent, 30 to 39, and 4 percent, 80 to 89. 82% of the participants came from the United States, 6% from Canada, 4% from the United Kingdom, 1% from Australia, 1% from Israel, and 6% other. In terms of race and ethnicity, 82.6% uh, responded white or Caucasian, 4.3% Hispanic or Latino, 3.8% Black or African American, 3.5% Asian or Pacific Islander, 0.9% multiracial or biracial, 0.5% Native American or Alaskan Native, 4.5% 4, 4 said that they did not wish to disclose or other category. In terms of gender, 90.5% of the group was female, 8.4% male, 0.9% preferred not to disclose, and 0.2% responded non-binary. In terms of the phase of TED that this group was in, 24% was in the active phase, 51% in the inactive phase, 25% said not sure. 69% were currently symptomatic, 21% uh, said they were not experiencing symptoms, and 10% said they were not sure. Um, of the survey group, 52% received their TED diagnosis from an ophthalmologist, 31% from an endocrinologist, 8% from a primary care doctor, 5% from, from an optometrist, 4% um, said they received their diagnosis from another um, medical expert, um, and then we, we went back and we asked, was your diagnosis confirmed um, by an ophthalmologist? And 84% of the group had had their diagnosis confirmed by an ophthalmologist. Uh, in terms of disease progression, 65% um, said their symptoms were about the same. 12% said symptoms were getting a little worse, 7% getting worse, 7% getting better, 6% getting a little better, and 3% not sure. So if you look at our survey group as a whole, 73% of the group was age 50 or older, 82% of the group was from the USA, 83% was white, and 91% was female. Now, so it's really hard to get good demographic data on what the TED population looks like as a whole. Um, there were a handful of papers out there but that provide us with some hints, and so, we pulled up one of those papers, um, which came out of the AAO IRIS registry, um, which was, was a database with thousands of medical records. And they looked at who had a TED diagnosis, who did not. Um, and basically, there were three groups that had the highest prevalence of thyroid eye disease compared to the whole. Um, so you were in one of these three groups if you were age 35 to 59. If you were female, that was at a ratio of about three times that of males and if you were African-American. If I had this survey to do again, um, I would take the information from the IRIS registry and from other projects, um, and I would have said, okay, what did our survey group look like? And then what groups have the highest prevalence? And I would have made really sure that we were reaching out to those groups to um, hopefully get a survey group that looks a little bit more like the TED population as a whole. So some additional limitations to our survey. Uh, this was a self-selected survey, whereas ideally you would have a random sample of all thyroid eye disease patients. Um, the TED diagnosis was self-reported as opposed to looking at medical records. Um, completing the survey required internet access and also adequate vision, um, which comes into play not in terms of just being able to see the survey, but also being able to complete the survey um, because it was very lengthy with 62 questions. 
Um, the survey was English language only, and some of the questions were a little bit specific, so some knowledge of TED was needed to answer them. So in terms of how long has our survey group been having symptoms, um, the, the largest um, chunk of this population had been living with TED for more than 10 years. Um, and then another 29% have had symptoms for five to 10 years. And we did ask about time since start of symptoms and time since diagnosis. And these ranges are so wide that you can't really tell a lot from looking at these two columns. Um, but this is really where the strength of the narrative uh, responses comes in. And so from the narrative responses, we were able to see that a lot of patients really struggled to get a correct diagnosis in a timely manner. Um, and I'll read some of these narrative comments, um, but again, I would encourage everyone to go to our website at gdatf.org um, and read these comments in full for yourself. I saw five different doctors. My first IMD told me my complaints were mental, all in my head. This was three months prior to finding a provider that listened and understood. I live in Zimbabwe. It has been difficult because I was misdiagnosed for over one year. My marriage suffered because we both did not know what was wrong with me. It was hard getting a diagnosis. I visited two local doctors who just prescribed eye drops that did nothing. It wasn't until I went to a major teaching hospital in a large city that I received a correct diagnosis. I was first diagnosed as a child, and at first the doctor told my mom that I was bugging my eyes for attention. And this, is a, this was a, a fairly long comment that um, spans over two slides. I went to my primary care physician and was sent to a gastroenterologist. My husband tore our master bath down to the studs looking for hidden mold. There wasn't any. I saw an allergist that treated me with antibiotics and did a CAT scan of my sinuses. I excluded all cosmetic and health and beauty products and tried various exclusion diets in search of an allergy. Finally, the second allergist I saw thought my neck looked large and thought the cause might be my thyroid. His office arranged for lab work and I was diagnosed with severe Graves' disease and TED. I believe he saved my life. So the survey asked which physical symptoms of TED have bothered you the most in terms of making life more difficult or causing pain and suffering over the past two months. 65% said dry, gritty eyes, 56% sensitivity to light, 43% bulging, 42% pressure and pain, 41% tearing, 39% redness, and this is continued, 35% double vision, 33% eyelid swelling, 32% blurred or cloudy vision or loss of vision, 21% inability to close the eyelid, 16% eyes pointing in different directions, and 2% color vision loss. So this is all of the symptoms that we asked about on one screen. Um, and I think it's also important to note that there was a none of the above option. Um, so people could have said, nope, you know what, I'm good, not having any problems. And that was 6% of the study, the survey population. Um, but I think it's important to note that uh, the top two, uh, dry, gritty eyes at 65%, and light sensitivity at 56%, um, these don't necessarily get as much of attention in terms of, um, you know, certainly our efforts as a foundation in terms of the research that's being done. Um, so I think it's it's really enlightening um, that these two issues are causing significant quality of life issues um, for our patient population. And um, again, I think one of the, the real strengths of this project um, was the, um, the color and the context provided by the narrative section. And so um, I'll read a few of the samples uh, that patients provided um, regarding their symptoms. My eyelids still do not close, even after four surgeries. My eyes water terribly every night while sleeping because they do not close all the way. My eyebrow is up all the time, so other than looking monstrous, I also look angry all the time. Some days I can't even have my eyes open due to pain and sensitivity and have to sit in a dark room with my eyes closed. Ted delivered brutal symptoms as I desperately searched for answers for nearly two years. 
terrible facial and eye pain while my eyes swelled up and began to slightly bulge. We also asked the survey participants over the past two months, which of the following have you experienced because of TED? And we were trying to get at quality of life issues here. Um, we found that 44% felt increased concern about their appearance. 37% felt sad, blue, or depressed. 36% felt a decline in confidence. 33% felt tense, edge, or tense on edge or anxious. 33% felt a decline in general well being. 20% felt a decline in ability to achieve goals. And 19% avoided going out into public. Um, now, this is not really new, the idea of this huge quality of life burden with thyroid eye disease. Um, and as we were looking at this data, I was reminded of a presentation from about 12 years ago from Dr. David Granite at one of our patient conferences. Um, and he was talking about research that they had done at UC San Diego Shiley Eye Institute um, regarding the quality of life burden with TED. And his quote from this talk was, we found levels of depression and anxiety that rival cancer and AIDS. Not looking like yourself hit people even worse than double vision. Um, so that I, I was reminded of the that quote um, as I look through the data here. So again, this isn't a new idea that there's a, a huge quality of life burden with TED. Um, but again, I think that the patient stories that came out of our survey um, really add important context here. And so I'll share some of those. Um, but again, these are in full at our website at gdatf.org. I struggled with physical and mental health during this. The anxiety, panic attacks, brain fog, double vision, change in appearance, headaches, pain in the eyes was taking me away from everything I was and knew. Doctors should heavily consider the psychological and social distress impact of this disease and as a debilitating disability that affects social, financial, and career outcomes. Not only did it change my vision, but it changed my appearance. That has changed my personality as I no longer have any confidence. I feel ugly. I used to have beautiful eyes and it makes me sad that how I look has changed and that people notice and wonder about how red and swollen my eyes are. My wife and I were dining out at a local restaurant and a young boy, eight or nine, having dinner with his family, looked at me, turned to his dad and said, look dad, that man has scary eyes. My wife and I paid our bill and that family's bill as well and left. I've never been out to eat in a restaurant since. This was about five years ago. So based on our survey, um, the groups that had the highest quality of life burden um, fell into one of these groups, um, double vision and bulging, um, a, a larger cluster of symptoms reporting more than five symptoms at once, um, they were the patients who are less than five years out from diagnosis, and they also tend to be under 60 years of age. And although this did not rise to the level of statistical significance, I do think it's an area that deserves further exploration um, in terms of race, ethnicity, and quality of life burden, and whether there, there may not be um, an even greater burden um, for specific racial and ethnic groups. Um, if you look at those who responded to Asian or Pacific Islander, um, eight out of 15 noted an increased concern regarding their appearance, um, which is 53%, and that's versus 44% of the entire study group. Eight out of 15 noted a decline in well being, and that's 53% uh, versus 33% of the group as a whole. Um, for those who responded Black or African American, 10 out of 17 reported feeling sad, blue, or depressed, and that's 65% versus 37% of the whole study group. 10 out of 17 had increased concern regarding their appearance, and that's 59% versus 44% of the whole group. Um, for those that responded Hispanic or Latino, uh, 12 out of 19 had increased concern regarding their appearance, and that was 63% versus 44% for the group as a whole. 11 out of 19 reported decreased confidence, and that's 43% of that group um, versus 36% as a whole. So um, by the time we parsed out the other factors that we found, um, you know, if you had double vision, if you had bulging, 
Um, if you were under 60 years of age, you had five or more symptoms. So by the time we parsed all of that out, we weren't able to get really good um, comparison data. Um, but um, just based on this, I do believe that this is an area where further study is needed. So another question that we asked was, over the past two months, which activities have been limited by 10? 45% of the survey group said reading, 28% driving a car, 23% socializing, 16% working, um, and there are quite a few comments um, regarding job and career on our website at gdatf.org. 11% uh, said taking care of myself, 7% taking care of family, and other 6%. And these are some of the patient comments around activities. It's nasty. Driving, TV, reading are all difficult. Double vision took away my love of reading and some activities with my kids. Even with prism glasses, I'm still limited in the angles I can look without incurring double vision. Playing pool or working on my car becomes difficult. So a few takeaways from this project as a whole. Um, just from Nancy and I, from the patient perspective. Um, first of all, as we discussed, the, the findings on quality of life burden with thyroid eye disease are, are not new, um, but the, the narrative comments from the survey um, really add important color and important context. Um, and again, you can see those in their entirety at gdatf.org. Uh, as we discussed, future surveys should more closely represent the TED patient population uh, in terms of demographics, um, but also the survey should be accessible for patients with low vision. Um, and we learned that when publishing survey results, um, we really need to be conscious of um, how can we put this in a format um, so that it is readable for patients who have low vision. Also, as we discussed, while double vision and bulging were associated with more severe quality of life declines, um, even what we sometimes consider, you know, quote unquote, um, minor symptoms, um, such as light sensitivity and such as dry, gritty eye, um, those things create a significant burden in terms of quality of life. Um, a bit of good news um, is that quality of life and daily functioning uh, did improve the farther that patients uh, were out from their uh, diagnosis. Um, however, it's important to note that a lot of participants um, 10 years or more out still reported significant impairment. 38% um, still have issues with reading. 33%, for example, were still concerned about their appearance. And so I, I think for us as a, a patient organization and for doctors and for researchers, um, there is, uh, deservedly so, a lot of focus on the most serious symptoms, um, the severe bulging and the severe swelling and the double vision. Um, but I think that none of us should lose sight of the fact that um, thyroid eye disease can still create a significant quality of life burden um, from those who are even 10 years out um, from the, the acute phase of the disease. Um, so if you are a patient that's been listening to this, um, thank you, first of all. Um, but second of all, um, where do you go from here? What do you do with this information? And I'll turn that over to Nancy. Thank you. This is probably one of the questions I asked myself back in 1990 when there was no information and no support groups and basically no internet. We have to find support. We don't look sick unless our eyes are bulging. We're, we're hanging in there. So people, people don't realize that we need support. One play, one way you might get support is ask your doctor if he or she would give your name to another patient that also has Graves and, and thyroid eye disease and could, would they call you? That way the doctor's not put in a way of violating HIPAA rules and things like that. He's not giving you the patient's name. He's giving yours to someone else. And most people that have tried to do that have had good luck. It's, we need to find support at home. That's really difficult because again, we don't look sick, our families, members don't understand what's going on. 
it's one reason it's there's two reasons to take say your spouse to a doctor's appointment with you one is they learn what's going on and the other is if you've got our wonderful brain fog going they can remember what was said and, and what the doctor explained and what the doctor didn't explain and so you've you've got a, a backup there find support again from your doctor you might need an evaluation from a major teaching hospital where the doctors there have a, a wider experience with with the the wider range of graves and, and ted and they could act as consultants in conjunction with your your local doctor please bear in mind that good doctors do not mind getting second opinions uncomfortable doctors are very uncomfortable with second opinions which should be a red flag to you if you if you get to the point where you are able to attend a local in-person support group or an online say zoom support group like we, we have right now just just talking with each other because the members of the support group know what we're talking about because we've all got it somebody might even mention you know well i'm even i'm seeing a counselor you might get the name or at least get the idea that an experienced counselor might might be good for you to help you because some of the problems have gotten so big and so convoluted that they're very hard to to stretch out and, and categorize and deal with. You can call the Graves Foundation and maybe get some names of counselors that are are familiar with with the thyroid. That's not what you learn in counselor school. You have to learn it later, but they are out there. But just remember, you need support, you deserve support, and you can get support. Back to you, Kimberly. All right. Um, thank you, Nancy. Um, and we'll share our contact information um, in the last slide, and then we'll also put it in the, the YouTube description. Um, if you are interested in joining one of the Graves Disease and Thyroid Foundation's uh, Zoom support groups, uh, we currently have uh, two meetings a month that we offer at varying um, days of the week and varying times. Uh, once again, this has been an overview of how patients experience thyroid eye disease, which was published in Frontiers in Endocrinology. So huge thanks to all of the patients who um, clicked on the link or took the survey or even tried to take the survey. Um, we know that a lot of times you have limited time during the day when you can comfortably work on the computer. Um, so thank you for, um, for sharing a little bit of time for us. Huge thanks also to our co-authors and to our sponsor. Uh, the project sponsor was Amgen. Um, the first four authors on the paper um, were actually the clinicians who came up with the idea for the original survey. Um, and Nancy, I know that you have worked um, with these doctors for many years, if not many decades. <laughs> Actually, decades is the right word. Um, Dr. Smith is our chief medical advisor on our board and has, has been a speaker at the 20 some odd conferences we've had over the years. I know Dr. Las Laszlo Hegedus from American Things, as well as things done through the Thyroid Federation International, Dr. Lesser and Dr. Peros. I've, I've, I can't tell you how long I've known them, but I can tell you how thoroughly expert they are. All right, thank you. And also, thank you to um, the team at Rare Life Solutions, who were also co-authors on the paper, um, they helped us take this project from the spark of an idea about a survey um, to putting together the actual questions, 
um, to publishing the survey, collecting and analyzing the data, and then finally uh, turning this into a published paper. Um, so thank you to, to everyone who helped us get this project over the finish line. And that is a wrap for this presentation. If you would like to reach out to the Graves Disease and Thyroid Foundation, uh, you can reach us uh, toll free in the USA and Canada at 877-643-3123. You can email us at info at gdatf.org, or you can visit our website at www.gdatf.org. Thanks and have a great day.